it's going. We're yeah. okay. So thank you very much. I don't understand Japanese, so it was very easy to sit through the introduction. Um, as I mentioned a little while ago during the ceremony, um, this day is a, a day in remembrance of our friend Yahiko Kambayashi, who just a few days from now, uh, five years ago, uh, died suddenly of a cerebral hemorrhage and shocked all of us who knew him and loved him. And I gave the title of this talk before I prepared it. And when I started preparing it, it actually turned into a somewhat different talk. So I hope you'll like uh, the talk I'm going to give rather than the one I'm not going to give. And our friend Kambayashi San was a man who improved the present and looked into the future and tried to help it grow. And besides his great interest in children, he was dean of informatics here and a computer scientist for, for many years. And one of the things that we wonder about in computing is does com computer science itself have a future? And what I mean by that is not whether computing has a future, because it has obviously inserted itself into every part of the lives of ever more people on the, on the planet, but whether the forward-looking study and understanding and invention of computing, uh, that's another story, because in fact, uh, compared to much of the work that was going on in the 60s and 70s when people were actively trying to find out what a computer science could mean, uh, much less of that kind of inquiry is going on today. And by this I mean, will the science word in computer science come to mean something like the other real sciences? Or will it be like the science in library science or social science, which means a gathering of knowledge, but not in the principled way that uh, physics and chemistry and biology uh, have been able to revolutionize our understanding of phenomena by using very different techniques than simply the gathering of knowledge. And uh, similarly, we have a term called software engineering which was also an aspiration in the late 60s. And the aspiration was to be a discipline like that, which caused the Empire State Building to be built in less than a year, including the demolishing of the original site. Less than a year, demolish, build the Empire State Building and start occupying it, uh, done uh, by a little less than 3,000 people. And I don't think there is any large-scale venture we could do in computing today that could organize 3,000 people to do something uh, as involved and complex an artifact as the Empire State Building. So in both these cases, the science in computer science is an aspiration, and the engineering and software engineering is an aspiration, and the question is, is whether these aspirations can be turned into something or whether uh, what we have right now will be uh, deemed good enough, and I don't, think it, I don't think it is good enough. So here's a, one way to think about uh, one or two of the problems. Um, the 400-page book is about 20,000 lines of some language and a foot of books is about 15 books and about 300,000 lines in some language. And the Empire State Building is about 22,000 books high 
about 440 million lines in some language. And uh, it seems like a lot, but consider that just Microsoft Vista and the Microsoft <laughs> Office together are about 260 million lines of code. That's about 13,000 books. Uh, nobody has ever read those books. I don't think anybody at Microsoft could tell you exactly what that code does, could tell you how to fix it, could tell you how to improve it. And uh, so if we take two s extremes at looking at these figures, one extreme says, well, that's the size, that's the actual complexity of the functionality delivered here. Uh, that in functionality, by the way, required me to reboot my computer uh, before giving this talk because it couldn't adjust, the software on it couldn't adjust to the projector in such a way to allow the application to display the full screen correctly. So in those 260 million lines of code, at least that feature is not uh, in there yet. So that will probably require uh, another million lines of code. Or the other extreme is that uh, this 260 million lines of code is grossly uh, bloated. That very little of it contributes to any kind of functionality whatsoever. And it's really kind of a mess. And I'm not really just picking on Microsoft because a very large worldwide company I call it LFP for large financial product company. Their uh, suite of products uh, comes to about 350 million lines of code or about 17,000 books. And their user interface has uh, a grand total of 145,000 different screens. And they use that term screens because I think they are still living back in the days of the IBM 3270 where that term was actually invented. So I doubt seriously whether the functionality actually delivered is in any way commensurate with the amount of code that people have to deal with. And of course, that code is not organized nearly as nicely as a book. It actually looks more like, like this. It looks like kind of like a garbage dump. And that's kind of what it is. And it's the kind of thing that would be condemned if anybody could ever look at it but if you look at a garbage dump through a window about this big, each little part of it only looks slightly messy. If you could look at the entire garbage dump of code, uh, I think we would be horrified. And it's not really a dump because people have to live with this. People usually don't live on a dump. So perhaps this is a city after a great disaster where people are still forced to live. And part of this, I think, comes from the small horizons that our brains uh, naturally have. Our brains are set up to worry about uh, what's going to happen in the next few minutes and next few hours. And we can remember fairly vividly the things that happened uh, a few minutes ago and a few years ago. Uh, but everything else is kind of blurry. And because nothing much happened 100,000 years ago, the uh, evolution didn't make our brains uh, to be in tune with the idea of progress. It was our brains are made for coping, not for progression. And so if there is a change, it's a little change one way or the other or a complete disaster but the idea of making things remarkably better in some way is not in our common sense reasoning. And the problem is we live in a time where this little window of a few years uh, behind 1970 and a few years ahead of 1970 is actually part of a progression that looks kind of like this, partly caused by Moore's Law and partly caused by uh, the Industrial Revolution and a number of other factors. Uh, and the problem is, is that when you look at a small part of an exponential curve, it can look linear. And our brains love linear things. And so we actually have to focus our will on change 
to try and understand whether uh, this change is actually really a linear change like our brains want it to, or whether it's one of these horrible Okay, wow. Don't believe me though, just because it sounds better. So again, because our, our brains are so limited, whenever we have to deal with very large things, uh, we're just overwhelmed by them and we start turning large things into uh, religions. So instead of thinking about the content of 10,000 books, we start believing it. So 200 million lines of code is too large for us. And uh, most people have never read 1,000 books. So 20 million lines of something is a lot. And if somebody were to present us with 100 books worth of something, that's a lot. 10 books uh, we can get through. 10 books is maybe what we're supposed to read in a, in a year at college. So that's one thousandth the 200 million lines there. And one book is something we could probably handle. 20,000 lines of something we could handle. And if you could imagine a large software system uh, that could be expressed in 20,000 lines of something, uh, that would actually be something like a Moore's Law for software. Right now we have an inverse Moore's law for software because as the positive Moore's law for software uh, for hardware is chugging along, we have the interesting property that much of the applications we use on this machine anyway actually take longer now to load than they did 20 years ago. So what it means is, is that uh, no matter uh, how much uh, the silicon factories in the world are improving the speed and capacity, the software people are actually taking that speed and capacity uh, away. Now, of course, this might be necessary. I've met many people who think this is a necessary thing, that actually what we have today is the best of all possible worlds. So we'll, we'll see whether that's really true. Now, the other problem is that 20,000 things can be too much. So here are 20,000 wires. Now, this is a real picture, not a staged picture. I'll not tell you where it, this picture was taken. But the person who started this off did it very innocently. One place had to be connected to another place, and the person got a wire and connected it up, and another place had to be connected to another place, and so that person or another person got a wire and connected it up, and pretty, much, pretty soon they had this. And this is kind of the way most software grows. Simple little things can be handled, but if those things don't scale, you wind up with this. And uh, the last couple of years, I've been asked embarrassing questions by my wife, who is a writer and a, an artist. And here is uh, an actual screenshot of her cinema-sized display at her home, and I just segregated the software she asked questions about. So there's one kind of software on the left, you can sort of see what it is, and there's another kind of software on the right. And her question is, well, in these apps here on the left, like Microsoft Word and Photoshop and so forth, I can, she says, I can see and do WYSIWYG authoring. So the stuff is right there and I can make a change in it and it shows me the change and it's fairly easy to work with. But over here on the right, all the stuff that has to do with the web, well, it isn't WYSIWYG. And 
And uh, so I have to go into special editing modes. I have to use a wiki. I have to edit through a keyhole. I have to do many different kinds of things. Well, it's embarrassing enough for her to ask me about that. What's even more embarrassing is the stuff she likes was invented in the 70s. The stuff she didn't like was invented in the 1990s, about 20 years later. So in fact, uh, a large percentage of the main software a lot of people use today because it's connected to the web is actually inferior to stuff that was done before and for no good reason whatsoever. There was nothing about this, the web that uh, prevents it from being WYSIWYG and easy to use. It was the people's attitudes who did the web browsers that prevented this, not anything technical. And so we call this reinventing the flat tire. In most sciences, you're uh, cautioned against reinventing the wheel because you're supposed to have read about what people have done before. And, uh, but it happens. But it's really bad uh, when the reinvention of stuff is worse than the original stuff because uh, people haven't paid attention to what's, what's been going on. And so basically, we could say the present doesn't compute. We're in a situation where the hardware capacity allows a lot of stuff that doesn't scale very well to barely survive. But in fact, it survives at the expense of being able to uh, improve it, make changes, understand it, and so forth. So this is what we want to look at in this little talk today. One way of looking at this is when a new idea appears, like the printing press, there are two separate ways of looking at this new idea. One is as news. News is incremental to what you already know. And so when the people saw the Gutenberg Bible, their reaction was, oh, this is, I understand this. This is doing much more cheaply and much more quickly what the monks did by hand. So this is an improvement to what I already know. And in fact, the Catholic Church did not think to suppress the printing press because it seemed to be working for them, it was making more Bibles. But along with news, if the idea has some potency, there's also new. And what was new about the printing press was going to be in about 100 years or so was the invention of science and the invention of new ways of governance. So kings were on their way out, and the power of the Catholic Church was on its way out, and nobody realized it because they didn't think about what was new about the printing press. And usually when something new comes along, there's a change in outlook. It's not just something incremental. There's a different way of looking at things. And in this case, the outlook shifted from a world that believed things to a world in which people started learning how to argue about things, how to be suspicious of things rather than believing things. And the problem with ideas is that our brains are set up for news. News is simple. News is incremental. It can be told very quickly. We've been doing it for 100,000 years. But new might require you learn something for five years before you can truly appreciate the new idea. So new is not very popular. Most things that are new are converted into news or done away with entirely. They're modified in some form that tries to kill off what's new and just use it as something that's a mere improvement rather than a change. Everybody likes change, if you talk to them. Everybody likes change except for the change part. So people are talking about change all the time, but the, uh, the actual ability to make a change in the face of a new idea is very difficult for most people. And our favorite Canadian, Marshall McLuhan, said this about goldfish. I don't know who discovered water, but it wasn't a fish. But he meant, we are the fish, and the water the fish is swimming in is our beliefs. 
Most of our beliefs we can't see. We can't even remember that we have them because we treat our beliefs as reality rather than uh, arbitrary things that uh, uh, we just happened to learn because we uh, grew up one place and not another. Now McLuhan was very good at pointing out the difference between news and new. So one of the things he pointed out about news is that the present for most people is only seen in terms of the past. It's interpreted by what people already know and it's thought of as reality. Well, it seems reasonable. I mean, that's all we bring, isn't it, into each present moment is the sum total of what we have been. How can we deal with the present in any, in any other way? One of his great lines was he said, until I believe it, I can't even see it. Another thing McLuhan said is that you shouldn't try to worry about whether something is true or false or good or bad when you first encounter it. Because if you do, you're bringing your past to make that judgment. Instead of worrying about things that are good or bad, true or false, you should simply try and find out what is going on. And he meant try to look at the present as it is. So this is a new idea for humans because most humans are brought up in a culture and they think of new as something that is damaging to their reality rather than thinking of their reality as a construct and a, and a, a perspective. And McLuhan pointed out that artists and scientists can see some of the present for itself and they do this in different ways. And because they can see the present a little bit, they can also see a little bit of the future. And that is basically what we have to do uh, in our field and also for our children. Now, why is this difficult? It has to do with the makeup of human genetics across the planet. We can learn new behaviors, but part of our behaviors come out of what we are as human beings. For instance, if you look at human beings across the planet and give them present them with a new tool or a new idea, about 95% of them will evaluate that new tool or idea as to whether it contributes to their current goals. So most people are already working on things, they have plans, they have goals, and they stick to those plans and goals very strongly. And if the new tool or new idea doesn't contribute to those plans or goals, they will uh, reject it. But about 5% of it look at it in a different way. 5% of human beings might change their current plans and goals in the presence of a new idea. So it's one in 20. Now if we look at human beings in a different way, 85% of us do most things uh, because other people deem them important. So this is called outer directed the goals that are chosen, the rewards that are gotten, are gotten by living in a society. It makes sense because we're social animals. And about 15% of us have more inner rewards, are less affected by what other people think. And if you combine these uh, two ways of looking at things, you get a picture that looks a bit like this, where only 1% of us is inner directed and interested in ideas and tools. And the other extreme is that 80% of us is outer directed and very conservative about holding on to our goals and very instrumental in our thinking. These are the two dominant reasons why new ideas have a hard time penetrating. And the newer an idea is, the more unusual it is, the more difficult it is. Because the 80% of us actually doesn't think about the ideas so much as looks for consensus. And so a typical time, uh, even for trivial ideas, to reach consensus for the 80% is about 30 years. And more complicated ideas may take uh, 50 years or even longer. So for this group, 
change has to be more or less almost agreed on by everybody before the change happens. And then 4% of us, I think a lot of engineers are in this group, are interested in ideas and tools and uh, want to work on problems the society deems important. And about 14% of us is very dangerous. If you think about what it means to be interdirected and very stubborn in your own pursuit of goals. This group makes a lot of politicians and uh, managers and so forth. So they, this is a tough group to deal with. So this is a very simple way of looking at uh, human beings, but it gives a lot of explanation as to why, uh, though it is relatively simple to come up with brand new ideas that are very powerful, uh, it is very, very difficult to disseminate those ideas. So we go back to 1970 and take a look at what, what was news back then. It was mainframes, the spinning tape drives, big computers owned by companies, sort of factory models of computing, and a strong belief that you should always get hardware and your operating system and your programming language and your tools and your user interface from a vendor that you should not try to make your own. And, uh, and many of these uh, ideas are still very prevalent today. For instance, cloud computing uh, and dealing with vendors uh, covers this space very well. And then right at the same time, about two dozen people from a community of several hundred at Xerox Park were doing things that were completely at odds with the news. So personal computing, uh, distributed networks, uh, uh, making your own tools, doing everything uh, that was new. And the focus was not on factory computing, but on, but on end users. So these are, if you will, this is the 80% versus the 1%. And the outlook of uh, the, this group uh, is a little too complicated to try and sum up in a talk. So I just picked one, one part of the outlook that I think uh, is kind of a, a good way of thinking about the way this uh, research community thought, and that is, it was a no centers outlook. That is, no discernible center, no hierarchy, uh, and because this group was also responsible for uh, inventing the internet, simple way of thinking about this is that everything is kind of like the internet. So, the networks themselves were distributed, whether it was a, an ethernet, or an internet. Um, inside the computers, there was no operating system. There was what you might think of as the internet all the way down. It's kind of interesting to think about a machine like this in which, if you calculate it out, it has about the capacity and the entire computing power of the entire internet in the 80s. Moore's Law. And so you'd expect, if you looked inside here, you'd find something that had thousands of virtual machines and uh, dozens of physical processors acting very much like your own local uh, internet, in fact, being a cache for the processes running on the internet. That's kind of the way we thought of it back then. But instead, what you find is something from the 60s called an operating system that essentially stovepipes most things in a very, very bad way. Makes it very difficult to integrate things, whereas it's very easy to integrate uh, on the internet. And of course, if you have a distributed uh, physical or virtual object system sending messages around, you don't need a programming language because you are already sending messages around, and a programming language in that context is simply putting some sort of reasonable syntax on the messages. Now just think if the people who many years later did HTTP realized what they were doing, 
they could have come up with some conventions for using HTTP, which would have made it the programming language of the entire internet. That would be incredibly useful instead of the ad hoc set of uh, you know, 20,000 wires or the garbage dump that we have today. But they didn't realize what it was that they were doing. And of course, people talk a lot about mash mashups, but in fact, that was the way things were done back in the 70s, because that's what you get when you have objects that integrate through a user interface. So and the, interf the user interface does not care where the code is that's actually generating these things. It's a way of presenting a whole bunch of things that are going on at the same time uh, in some relationship, and these relationships can be driven by, uh, by making relationships between them. And so what we would call an application would actually be just a set of useful objects working together with no stove piping like we have today. And then finally, the idea was let's not have any mainframes, let's just make zillions of uh, personal computers, and these personal computers themselves uh, had virtual processors. So the original Alto at Xerox Park had 16 virtual processors. So the whole thing was done without centers from top to bottom, the hardware and the software. And of course, some of these ideas came out into the 80s and we use them today. But what's interesting is what ideas did come out, which were mainly the ones that had no competitors, like the Ethernet. There just wasn't anything that competed with it. And to a much smaller extent, the user interface. Uh, but in fact, uh, as far as the programming techniques and the architectural techniques, almost none of it came out. Uh, what we got is what we had in the early 60s and pretty much what we have today. And underneath this is this glorious thing called the internet, which now has several billion nodes, has never broken, has never had to be stopped in order to be fixed. All of those things that could be possible with the software systems of today, but because of the way they're made, simply aren't, uh, have never happened, and it'll be very hard to make happen in the future. So one of the ways you get rid of 20,000 somethings is by finding an abstraction that will deal with what, what this thing is doing. What this thing is doing is simply getting messages to go from one place to another, and the being able to string a wire from one place to another means that at some point you have to have the option of being able to send a message from any one node to another node. And by the way, that's just what the Ethernet and the Internet do. But they did it by virtualizing what used to be switches into a message passing situation. And so instead of having an, an increment that doesn't scale, you can almost always make something that scales very, very well by completely virtualizing the computer you have into some new kind of computer. And that's kind of the message of this talk. So when computers came about, they had features. Let's make more of them. The message of personal computing was the, it's the end user that's the important part of this, because a human is going to wind up using them. And therefore, the hard part of the design problem has to do with how you deal with the end user. Uh, one of my favorite people on the planet is Jeanette Wing. Uh, she uh, is a great computer scientist, a theoretical computer scientist, the dean of computer science at CMU, and she's currently the funder of most of the computer science funding in the United States. And you can see she has a very unique way of teaching because she is a black belt in karate. And uh, I understand the, the students in her class really listen when she talks. And her definition uh, about computing is it's the automation of abstractions, which I think is a pretty good sentence. But we have to think about that for a second, because what if you were born in 10,000 BC with an IQ of 500? 
But what if you were born Leonardo in the 15th century? Leonardo was smarter than anybody in this room, but he couldn't invent a single motor for any of his vehicles that he wanted. So even though he was smarter than most of the people who have ever lived on the planet, he wasn't smart enough. He needed to be born into a different century. And here's a guy who wasn't nearly as smart as Leonardo, Henry Ford, but he was born at the right time when there was knowledge that came out of science and the improvements in engineering to start inventing uh, internal combustion engines, which had been invented a few years before in Germany. And all of a sudden, uh, that plus the Industrial Rev Revolution allowed Henry Ford to make vehicles that Leonardo could only dream of by the millions. And so knowledge generally trumps IQ. If you know a lot, it helps to be smart. But if you're smart and you don't know a lot, it doesn't help much. And finally, what's more important than knowledge is outlook. And I realized uh, when I was explaining this talk this morning that I should have put Isaac Newton in there because it was Newton, more than any other single person, that made Henry Ford possible by completely changing the outlook on uh, what the physical universe was like as far as uh, European civilization was concerned. And what Outlook does is to give you a stronger way of looking at things by changing your point of view. And that point of view informs every part of it. It tells you what kind of knowledge to get, and it also makes you uh, appear to be much smarter. So a person with relatively normal IQ plus the calculus is smarter than Archimedes, Archimedes was uh, in ancient Greece. So I like to say knowledge is silver, but outlook is gold. I dare say that in most schools in the United States, most universities and most graduate schools uh, attempt to teach knowledge rather than outlook. And yet we live in a world that has been changing out from under us, and it's outlook that we need uh, to deal with that. And by contrast to these two, IQ is just a big lump of lead. It's one of the worst things in our field that we have clever people in it because like Leonardo, none of us is clever enough to deal with the scaling problems that, that we're dealing with. So we need to be less clever and be able to look at things from better points of view. So if we go back to Jeanette here, what we really want to say is computing is the automation of abstractions in powerful outlooks. We must find those also. Now, if we go back to reinventing the flat tire question, what's in the browser? Well, JavaScript, it's a programming language. The DOM and other graphics, not very good. But what's interesting is the two of these together is more powerful computationally than the Alto was at Park in the 70s. And the Alto could do all of these things, user interface and the development system and desktop publishing, all of that stuff, WYSIWYG, in about 10,000 lines of code. It's not a lot of code. This code was virtualized. And so if we go back to the browser again, we could say, well, why don't we just do a Xerox Park? Let's, let's forget about JavaScript and just use JavaScript as an Alto. It's actually faster than an Alto. But let's not let JavaScript seep into the better architecture we need uh, to, to do our uh, WYSIWYG environment inside a browser. So we're going to draw a line there, and we're going to say, OK, this is machine code here. It's not the way we want to program, but we can make something out of it. So we get the guy who did this at Xerox Park originally, Dan Ingalls. And on top of that, we put a real architecture that's known to be able to build these kinds of environments. And lo and behold, if you go to Lively Kernel, type Lively Kernel into Google and do it in Safari especially, you'll get to see an entire WYSIWYG environment done completely in the browser without any downloadable executables. This has always been possible. 
And I believe it is a black mark against our field that even though it has always been possible, almost nobody who's working with uh, this modern software realizes it's impossible or realizes how to do it. This is why I don't think we quite have a real field. And I believe we're in danger of losing computer science completely. So one way of looking at it is the simple way of looking at computers is they can be programmed and people are incrementing this by making systems using programs that are kind of like the computer they're programming on and kind of like the programming language they're programming with. But in fact, a computer is more interesting than that. It can be programmed to be like any mechanism you want, including a completely different kind of computer, a completely different kind of programming language. And that's what we should be doing. I believe most of the sludge, most of the bloat, has to do with trying to make very, very large structures out of just bricks rather than trying to invent arches. So embedding abstractions here is something that we have to be very careful with. We don't want to take the news, the simple abstractions that come to mind when you think of aggregating bricks. You get piles and walls. And what we need are these non-obvious structures that give us enormous ability to scale uh, without having to use lots of material. And in fact, abstractions that have great power tend to be able to go on t-shirts. So Maxwell's equations, it's not, it's not a complete test. But generally speaking, if you have a good idea, you should be able to invent the mathematics that will express that idea on a t-shirt. So Maxwell's equations works pretty well. E equals mc squared works pretty well. You can put the American Constitution on a t-shirt. And you can put um, the first great programming language, and maybe still the greatest of all time, Lisp. 50 years ago, McCarthy wrote this. It's put on a t-shirt, and it is sufficient to describe what Lisp is all about. This is something you just don't see generally in computing today, is this idea that something should not only be able to work, but it should actually be brought into a, a form that's actually understandable. And we can do this in a modern form. So Alex Warth, in our uh, Viewpoints Research Center, took a look at JavaScript and found that if you mathematize JavaScript, uh, you could do it in about 165 lines of code, which can be put on a t-shirt. Looks about like that. And Alex is here, right there. Raise your hand. So if you want to find out more about this, talk to him. Now, the scales in computing, though, are much larger than the scales in bricks. So there are things that have to do with uh, things that are not even like long uh, polymer chains of molecules, which have uh, many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of atoms in them, but more like uh, living organisms. We, in fact, have 100 trillion cells and inside each of our cells, there are 60 billion informationally interacting components. So a single human being is far more complex than all of the computation that we have on the planet. And it's organized in such a way that uh, it has no centers as well. So it's something we can learn from. And we can come back to the internet, which is run by a few tens of thousands of lines of code. but we should be able to do something with that. And here's Ian Piamarda, who's another Viewpoints researcher who was able to make a TCP IP in about 160 lines of code. And that's getting close to the kind of description you need to make a system that it can expand out several billion fold uh, without breaking, without having to be stopped, that's reformulatable, and so forth. So one way of thinking about it is that uh, a bright future for software should be a future in which the kernels are very, very simple, but very, very comprehensive. So they're kind of a special kind of DNA designed very carefully to allow replication by billions and even trillions uh, in a way that assures that the system cannot break. So one way of summarizing 
what's going on today. The general practice today, I think, is below any reasonable kind of mi minimum. A lot of what's taught in universities is below any reasonable kind of minimum. If you look at the best from the 70s, from this community that brought most of the inventions, it's a qualitatively better than the minimum bar. The best knowledge of today is better than that. But the real bar today is up here. And what we need is something like that, and we don't have it. So this is one of these situations where going back to the good stuff of the 70s or trying to look at the best practice of today is not going to help us. Somehow we have to look ahead. We have to do something perhaps here that is pointed there. And I believe this is one of the main goals for computer science and software engineering over the next 10 years and uh, whether the field can actually tackle a problem like this and be able to come through on it is really going to determine whether there's a computer science or a software engineering left at the end of these 10 years. If not, I think it will just be gone and what we'll have is uh, enormous ad hoc uh, mechanisms that are in one of the longest, slowest crashes in history. So we have to go from these very simple ideas of programming to this more biological way of looking at things. And this is going to require an enormous outlook cha change. It's not basically an algorithmic way of looking at things, but a systems way of looking at things. A way of looking at things that is not taught in most universities in the United States. And I don't think it's taught in Japan either. So just getting the field, now that it's set in its ways, to make a change like this, even though the best artifacts of the past were done this way, I think is going to be very difficult. Minsky, one of my favorite mad scientists, wrote a great book called The Society of Mind, talking about the uh, possible modular organization of human minds. And if you think about it, a system that moves beyond the internet in scaling and capacity and ability to do uh, nonlinear things safely is going to need something like a system psychology in that uh, you know the tiniest bit of it is embedded in TCP IP uh, in the balancing mechanisms that are, are uh, the heuristics that are distributed over the net yet keep things from getting too bad. I think to go to the next level to be able to do large-scale applications this way is not just one qualitative jump, which we should have taken about 20 years ago, but is now two qualitative jumps. So we're gradually getting more and more behind. The other thing is that the what was new 30 years ago is now news. And so what we have to do, again, is ask ourselves, what is new about computing that we've missed all these years and we are failing to take advantage? And we can sum up what we did in user interface at Xerox PARC with a simple sentence. But what we need to do in the future, we don't have that sentence yet. That's up to you. This is what the young people in the field should be trying to do, is not to increment on what's already here, but try to understand what's actually going on and what is actually needed for a true planetary software system. So for user interfaces, uh, when Engelbart showed his stuff 40 years ago, um, one of the things he said that people just completely didn't believe was that people, he said, people will spend hours every day in front of their computer screens. And people said, people couldn't even imagine that because Engelbart at that time had really the only system in the world in which you could even, uh, even make that statement. But when you spend hours every day in front of something, it's like being in a room of a house. It's like being in a, in a dwelling. 
And so we have to ask, what kind of house do we want to live in? And this house is not just a visual house. This house has things in it, the tools that we need. So we have to ask those questions. And this house has to be something that allows children to live in it. What would be a great design for that house in, for the next several decades? And when I go around and talk to universities, a lot of people, particularly professors, just think that what we've got is it. And I take great pain because most of them were not alive when this stuff didn't exist. It seems natural to have an internet. It seems natural to have personal computing. But there was no mouse before 1964, and there was no not internet before 1969. Real personal computers, 73. GUI was 74, no Ethernet before 75. So back then, every single one of those things was deemed impossible by most people. And the next set of stuff that we have to do is something that is absolutely possible, but we have to see it as possible in order to even start it. So this is probably the best of the meta punchlines by Susan Sontag, the writer. So we have to start off by not accepting the world as it appears. We have to start thinking about the world the way we want it to be before we can start doing something with it. And in Alice in Wonderland, the Red Queen is trying to get Alice to think better and tells her that you need to try to understand three impossible things before breakfast. And we think we can see things, but we actually cannot even start to see things until we admit to ourselves that we're blind. We have to realize that we're fragile, very poor thinking creatures. And in this talk, I've tried to weave two things together. I've tried to weave ideas, content about our field, and I've tried to uh, cross-purpose them with principles. And I've been jumping back and forth like this. And this gets very confusing. It's just a mess of stuff here. And yet this mess of stuff actually can form a coherent picture if we can back off enough and relax. And that picture is not what we thought it was. It's a different way of looking at things made out of a bunch of separate things. But these separate things are integrated together. And all of a sudden, we see a new whole and a new reality. So our dear friend, Yahiko Kambayashi-san, helped make our future. We have to make the next future. And we have to start now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.